Howdy, you, everyone. Welcome back to Book Light. We'll begin with opening prayer and then an introduction. Om. 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 Om Sahana Vavatu, Sahano Bunatu, Sahadiriam Karavavahai. Tejasvinavadhitamastumavidvishavahai Om Shanti 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 Samasta Janakalyane Niratam Karunamayam Namami Chinmayam Devam Sadkurum Brahma Vitvaram Hariyam, everyone. Welcome to part three of the second series of Book Light. <laughs> For those of you who have been following with us, we're taking separate sadhanas from Sadhana Panchakam, a set of 40 sadhanas given by Sri Adi Shankaracharya Ji to his disciples. Within each week, we'll see a satsang by Shubhani Ji, then a chick exclusive discussion, and then Three of our chicks will come and present their findings on the verse. We'll chant the first verse, lead and follow, and then we'll get started with our first speaker. Tahana, are you ready? Awesome. Ready. Vedo Nitya Madhiyatam Vedo Nitya Madhiyatam Taduditam karma swanushtiyatam. Taduditam karma swanushtiyatam. Tene shasya vidhiyatam. Tene shasya vidhiyatam. Apachitihi kame matistya jyatam. Apachitihi kame matistya jyatam. Papo gahpari duyatam. Papo gahpari duyatam. Bhava suke do shonu sandhiyatam. Bhava suke do shonu sandhiyatam. Atme chavya vasiyatam. Atme chavya vasiyatam. Nijagraha turnam vinir gum yatam. Nijagraha turnam vinir gum yatam. Now, once all together. Vedo nityamadhiyatam, taduditam karma swanushtiyatam. Tene shasya vidhiyatam, apachitihi kame matistya jyatam. Papo gappari duyatam, bhavasuke dosho nu sandhiyatam, atme chavya vasiyatam, nijakriha turnam vinir gamyatam. Sahana, I keep going high. <laughs> uh, good to see all of you. And for those of you who are tuning in on Facebook, good to see you too. Join us on Zoom if you would like for a more interactive experience. So now I'll introduce our first speaker for this evening, Divya. Divya is currently residing in Vancouver and is a recent graduate from medical school. Here to share her thoughts now on the second father of the first on the second half of the first father, Divya, I'll hand it off to you. Hari Om. Thank you, Amarji. Om Shri Chinmaya Sadguravi Namaha. Hari Om, everyone. Thank you very much for this opportunity to truly dig deeper into a small but packed sadhana from Shri Adi Shankaracharya in Sadhana Panchakam. So, Taduditam Karma Svanushtiyatam. Tat means that, referring to the Vedas, as was talked about in the first sadhana in of Vedo Nitya Madhiyatam. Uditam has a few different meanings, including signified, indicated, or even experienced by. 
karma means duties, responsibilities, or actions. And swanushtiyatam, meaning to perform diligently. So putting it all together, this means perform diligently the duties ordained by the Vedas. The first two questions that arose when I read about the sadhana were, what is karma and how do I determine my karma? So to address the first question, karma in this context means respons responsibilities or actions, as I mentioned earlier. But there is more to it than just physical action in Advaita Vedanta. In Gurudev's commentary of chapter 4, verse 16 and 17 of Bhagavad Gita, he emphasizes the importance of understanding that action has two parts. The physical action as well as the mental, mental intention or motive behind the action. The mental intention has the power to drastically improve the quality of the actions. Now to answer the second question of how do I determine my karma, Shubhani ji provided a lot of information in her discourse. This really challenged me to connect a lot, all of the information in a meaningful way in order to apply it effectively to my own life. One of the key points I took away was that the Vedas provide a general framework and it is our job to take that framework and customize it to our own journey. As I'm a very visual learner, I wanted to begin by walking through a diagram of what we learned. Then I'd like to use this framework to go one step further to make this applicable to us through some examples of real people. So I'm going to share my screen. And please let me know if you can see this. Yes? Okay, awesome. So, um, there are two major branches to consider to help us determine our karma, our actions, specifically our niyata karma. So the first branch is ashrama and the second branch is varna. So on the left side, I have uh, put our starting point of birth. And on the top, I will be um, showing you the ashramas and the bottom will be showing you the varnas. So here we have the ashramas. And uh, so first we have brahmacharya, then grihastha, vanaprastha, and then sannyasa. I will not repeat Shivaniji's wonderful talk, but I have included keywords under each to remind us of the purpose of and the karma associated with each phase. One of the most important points that came up during our chick discussion was that each of these stages are not fixed. You may have different karmas that you feel are fitting for other ashramas, but your predominant ashrama should be one of them. For example, if you are in the Grihastha or Vanaprastha ashrama, that does not mean that you should not learn new skills, which one might associate with the Brahmacharya ashrama. Similarly, if one is predominantly in the Brahmacharya ashrama, as some of us might be in currently, this does not mean we cannot apply the teachings of the Vedas to our lives through sadhana and seva, which one would associate with the Vanaprastha ashrama. Another important point was made through Shivaniji's wonderful example of someone who chose to get married and simply because of their personal dislike of this stage wants to jump to the Vanaprastha stage. She mentioned it very briefly, but I wanted to dissect this example a little further um, because I think that the, the reason, the important thing here is that the reason for moving from one ashrama to the next should not be as a sort of escape route or a way to avoid the responsibilities of the ashrama that you're in. Instead, we should only leave an ashrama when we have completed our duties in that phase and are truly ready to move forward to the next phase. Each of us may have varying amounts of time in each ashrama also based on our own journey. The second branch that is important is in determining our karma begins at birth with our vasanas. So vasanas are our innate tendencies and, and are the impressions made on our consciousness by the karmas performed in previous lives. These desires or tendencies determine our predominant gunas, as shown here, uh, which are our mental temperaments. Although most of us probably know this. As a quick review, they are sattva, pure and noble, which is associated with the color white, rajas, passionate and, uh, and agitated, associated with the color red, 
thumbus, dull and inactive, associated with the color black. Different permutations and combinations of these gunas form the varnas, which means our coloring or personality. So it, I got uh, kind of creative with my diagram here, so bear with me, stick figures is the way I go. Um, so first I have the earth and the four different varnas here depicted, and I'm using the sun to um, depict our creator. So I have utilized the colors representing the gunas as indicated here to show how close each of these varnas is to seeing their true nature of Atman represented by the sun. If we were to use approximate percentages, Shudra would be 60% tamasic or black, 30% rajasic or, or red, 10% sattvic or white. Shudra is generally associated with laborers such as janitors, cleaners, cooks, or maids. Vaishya should, or would be approximately 30% tamasic, 60% rajasic, and 10% sattvic. Vaishya is generally associated with tradespeople, shopkeepers, and farmers. Kshatriya would be 10% tamasic, 60% rajasic, and 30% sattvic. Kshatriya is generally associated with doctors, politicians, scientists, and innovators, people who use their mind a lot um, for their uh, careers. And lastly, Brahmana would be 10% uh, tamasic, 30% rajasic, and 60% sattvic. Brahmana is generally associated with priest and sannyasin. Now, if you imagine that each of these stick figures representing each varna is looking through their combination of colors representing their mental quality or guna. How much light would they be able to see from the sun in this diagram representing the creator? Well, the sattvic predominant brahmana um, has less color to see through because white is also associated with the atman. So just the red, the little bit of red and black that they have. So they're able to see uh, themselves a little bit more as one with the creator. Whereas um, the tamas predominant shudra has more color to see through, to see themselves as one with the creator. Another point I wanted to bring up is that you may or may not have noticed that I have done my best to use a horizontal approach instead of a vertical one, because many of us have a tendency of creating hierarchies, which gives off the feeling that one is superior to another. I wanted to emphasize that all of these Varnas are necessary parts of a functional society and one is not considered above another. I wanted to pause briefly here to talk about the true meaning of Varnas. For generations, Varnas were misrepresented into a labeling system that people were given at birth based on the Varna of the family they were born into. Although many of us probably understand this now, there appears to still be some confusion on this. So to very clearly move away from this mentality, Sri Krishna states clearly in chapter 4, verse 13 of the Bhagavad Gita, Chatur Varnyamaya Srishtam Gunakarma Vibhagashaha Chatur Varnyam, or the fourfold caste system, Maya Srishtam, meaning has been created by Krishna, Gunakarma Vibhagashaha, according to the differentiation of Guna and Karma. This essentially means that the varnas or fourfold caste system of an individual was to be determined by the mental quality or gunas and physical action or karmas. Therefore, your birth to parents who were labeled as brahmanas by this misused system for years could or does not determine that you are one. Also, no physical markings obtained during life can determine this. So now putting these two branches together, we can determine what our niyata karma is, which is a combination of nitya karma, meaning our daily duties, and naimitika karma, meaning our occasional duties. Now, let's go through a couple different examples and feel free to write your answers in the chat box if you wish. So my first example is a middle-aged single father who works as a waiter in a coffee shop. So which ashrama do you think he would be in? Anybody? <laughs> I can't really see the chat box with this, but I'm gonna say that, uh, oh, actually I do see a couple. 
Yes, Grihasta, absolutely. So um, next, which Varna do you think he would fall under? Okay, so this is actually a trick question. Our knee jerk or the knee jerk of secular society may be to label him as Shudra or Vaishya, but the truth of the matter is that we cannot determine this. This is because our Varna is determined by our mental quality, so only he can determine that. So he could be categorized as Shudra if he is doing the most minimal work possible to earn the bare minimum to feed himself and his son and spend the rest on gambling or other tamasic tendencies or actions. On the other hand, he could even be a Brahmana if he has a, a strong devotion and understanding of the higher and feels that uh, that oneness towards all the customers whom he serves every day and aligns his actions, words, and thoughts towards the creator. So the main point here is that the Varna of the family he was born into and his external circumstances do not determine his Varna. It is only his mental quality that determines his Varna. My other example is that of a doctor. She is in a profession where she's constantly giving back to her patients. Regardless of her age or whether she has a family, what ashrama would you categorize her as? So she would also be in the grihastha phase because she's working and giving back to her community and supporting, um, supporting other uh, people in the society. And what varna would you classify her as? So I hope you all got the idea from the previous example. Um, his, her, her varna can be any of the four based on her state of mind. If she's doing work with the motive to earn money for herself, to live in luxury and drink a lot, she could, she could be considered a shudra or vaishya. But if she's doing her work for the purpose of earning money to sustain her family, is taking leadership to educate her community in maintaining health to prevent future hospitalizations, and is supportive of those in the Vanaprastha and Sanyasa phases of their life, she would be classed, classified as predominantly Kshatriya. And lastly, a very short example is that of a Sanyasin. Their, uh, their ashrama would be classified as sannyasa, but whether or not they are under the vadna of brahmana is dependent on, again, the quality of their mind. I hope these examples were helpful in emphasizing that this is a framework that must be customized to your own life and circumstances. As a summary, we reviewed the meaning of Sri Adi Shankaracharya's second sadhana, then we reviewed the true meaning of karma and action to emphasize that the intention behind the physical action has the power to drastically change the quality of your actions. We then went through a pictorial representation, a rather rudimentary one on my part, um, to review the framework and determine our niyata karma and went through some examples to hopefully be able to understand how to customize this to our own lives. Once again, thank you for the opportunity for me to dig deeper on this topic. And I hope you're able to bring a practical approach to this topic um, that I went through myself in preparing for this talk. Adiyom. Awesome, Devia. Thank you so much for sharing. Next, we'll have Mira speaking. And Mira is currently in Southern California and working as a technology consultant. Hariyom, Mira. Hariyom, everyone. And thank you, Shivani Ji and Amar Ji, for the opportunity to speak about this week's topic. In my talk today, I will be discussing Swadharma, or one's duty or dharma, Paradharma, or the dharma of others. Uh, Vedas as a guideline for our lives, some examples of Swadharma and important points about Swadharma from different gurus. Finally, I will be discussing a reflection activity that I've been practicing recently in order to help guide myself towards finding my Swadharma. Uh, so with that, I'll begin. Tat uditam karma swanashtiyatam. This is the second half of the first line of the first verse of Sadhana Panchaka written by one of our gurus, Sri Adi Shankaracharya Ji. The phrase, though quite short, is full of deep meaning about our purpose. 
It means whatever karma is prescribed by the Vedas, whatever actions you are to take, you must do them diligently and with the right intended purpose. So as Shubhaniji spoke to us earlier, she explained that the two main karmas we are to perform are Nitya Karma and Naimitika Karma. So within Nitya Karma or the daily duties and activities, there are five yagnas to be performed. And some of these include pujas, prayers, and service uh, may be dedicated to bettering humanity. So in fulfilling Naimitika Karma, we take responsibility to perform actions um, on rare occasions like a marriage. And then other karmas that we should not actively or regularly need to perform are kamya karma or actions that are prompted by desires, nishida karma or adharmic actions that should be avoided altogether, and prayaschitta karma, which are actions done for atonement of adharmic acts. So as we reflect on our daily karmas and the karmas we should be doing, as well as our intent behind performing each action, we have to remember that an important tenet of Advaita Vedanta as a philosophy is about evaluating our potential responses to like external stimuli. Basically what this means is that each day we're tasked with determining which choices will allow us to stay on the path of dharma and continue you know, to work towards purifying our minds in order to reach the ultimate truth. However, we can't necessarily seek out the Vedas for a one-stop answer, like one might do with another religious text in another faith. Because the Vedas and Shastras only provide us with guidelines for making decisions. We ourselves must figure out where we fit applications of these guidelines to our daily lives. So for example, the Vedas can provide a basic framework for following duties diligently, but they don't expand on what duties to do and how to determine your diligence specifically as it pertains to your individual circumstance. So for this reason, whatever may be your duty or dharma, sometimes it may neither feel like the best choice nor the easiest choice. And a good example of this sort of classically is the situation where Arjuna speaks to Bhagavan Krishna on the battlefield. Um, he questions how it can be his dharmic duty to fight in a war against his cousins, the Karavas, because he could cause them harm or even kill any of his relatives. So Sri Krishna responds to him that as Arjuna is a Kshatriya, his duty as a Kshatriya may not be the easiest to fulfill, especially in his case, but it is an important step in that context to free the people from a tyrannical rule. So this example is, is important because although we are not ourselves soldiers facing those kinds of circumstances, the concept of performing your duty may also draw similar controversy in your mind, but you have to remember that your you know, duty or dharma should be performed and achieved with great diligence. So as we attempt to determine how best to apply these different ideas to our daily actions, we can think of Vedic philosophy like a prescription. So if you think about it, Vedic philosophy and thought frameworks are like directions for achieving the best health, both mentally and physically, but it's not a quick fix or short-term medication like a pill. It's for our long-term benefit to study the Vedas and change our behaviors and take action to preemptively avoid negative results, not simply just to treat the problem after it arises. So in that same manner, when we look inwardly and introspectively, we can see that our actions may be dictated by our gunas, and our gunas may lead us to engage in our swadharma, meaning you know, our dharma or duty. So in this context, it's important to note that swadharma is our field of expression, like Shubhaniji spoke to us about. It's not necessarily our career or our talent. It's not really a hobby either, or something that we've cultivated out of practice. Um, it's an expression or a process that is essentially transmitted by sharing knowledge. We should stay within our swadharma because when that karma is performed well, it will benefit not only ourselves, but the others around us. This sort of belief is a core value of Sanatana Dharma. And it's exemplified in the saying, Sarva, uh, Sarve Jana Sukhino Bhavantu meaning let all the people be happy. Discovering our own capabilities and performing them selflessly is the ultimate goal of our lives. And it is also important to remember that our faith deals with realities rather than illusions. So Swadharma is not like a destiny, 
but it's a it's an amalgamation of our capabilities, which allows us to live out our potentials and benefit the world around us. Um, what's important here is that the Bhagavad Gita tells us not to take up paradharma, meaning the dharma of others, no matter the merit involved. Uh, in Srimad Bhagavad Gita, chapter 3, verse 35, uh, Lord Krishna says to Arjuna that it is better to perform one's natural prescribed duty, though tinged with faults, than to perform another person's prescribed duty, though perfectly. It is in fact preferable to die in the discharge of one's duty than to follow the path of another, which is fraught with danger. In addition to this thought, Mahapariva, 68th pontiff, uh, in one of his teachings chronicled in Devadin Kuro, which means voice of God in Tamar, he emphasized the practice of Swadharma and shuns Paradharma. Meaning if someone chooses Paradharma for his own personal gains, he's said to be sort of giving in to desire and swaying from the right path of dharma. Uh, kind of building on this point, Sri Aurobindo also clarified in essays on the Gita, he says that all human work is subject to fault, defect, or limitation, but that should not make us abandon our own proper work and natural function. So our swabhava and our swadharma together give us clues to find the work that we need to do. So using those clues, the work that we will do will sort of give us joy. It will also be done well, and it will also be useful for others. You know, if we give ourselves to this occupation with true conscientiousness and perseverance, then we will discover our inner call. So the application of Vedic philosophy and discovering Swadharma is evident in many real life examples as well. Several great personalities have also discovered their true callings this way. Uh, for example, Mahatma Gandhi, while working as a barrister in South Africa, was once ejected from a train. Shivering through the wintry night in the waiting room of the Peter Marksburg station, Gandhiji found his swadharma to fight colonial oppression and ultimately lead the nonviolent struggle for the independence of India. So this discussion of complex ideas like karmas and gunas and swadharma really drives home one important question. How do we seek out swadharma, our swadharma, and perform it diligently, right? So it's a certainly challenging task to find our swadharma and sort of stick to it, especially in that particular time period of your life. Well, we have to determine our natural aptitude and our place in society while also combining our innermost tendencies. Well, that requires a great deal of internal reflection and a genuine effort to remove our sort of kamya karma or our desire induced actions. So the pursuit sort of finding swadharma involves sort of sticking to our particular phase in life. So whether you're a brahmacharya or otherwise, and working on our chosen swadharma to reach our maximum potential. Personally, as a young adult, I'm still trying to figure out what my swadharma is. So I am working full-time now, but I'm yet to find my swadharma, my phase of life as a brahmacharya. I've started performing a reflection experiment every week by logging my daily activities and then doing a reflection at the end of the week to determine which activities have provided myself and other people the most meaningful and fulfilling experience. Trusting yourself to guide you on this path towards finding and fulfilling Swadharma is not easy and I myself am definitely still in this process, but when I have been doing this reflection activity, you know, I've been finding that it is deeply reflective and it's an organized way to sort of manage my thoughts and emotions. Um, with that, I definitely encourage all of you to try the same practice as well this week if you can. Um, so sort of to conclude, you know, today we've discussed Swadharmas, Vedas as a prescription for life, examples of Swadharma in Vedic philosophy, the dangers of taking up Paradharma or the Dharma of other people, um, we've also discussed Swadharma as it has been sort of dictated by different gurus. And of course, I talked about the reflection activity that I hope will help all of you determine your Swadharma. Um, so thank you again for this opportunity and Hari Om. Hari Om, Mira. Thank you for sharing. And now we have Srikanth who was taking the final um, perspective on this uh, verse. And Srikanth is currently a biomedical engineer 
working in New York City. So, Hariyam Shikant. Hariyam. Om Shri Chinmaya Satgurave Namaha. I thank you to Amarji Shivani Ji and the team for giving me this chance to reflect for the last two weeks on this really amazing sadhana. Sadhana, as you've heard now from Amira and Divya, is Taduditam Karma Svanushtiyatam. Perform the actions as defined in the Vedas diligently. And when I was reflecting on the sadhana, what I was drawn to was the purpose of the sadhana. That to me, on the surface, you know, the purpose is to develop good habits and to replace bad habits. But more deeply, the purpose of the sadhana is to build the tools to help us to find our, our true purpose, our swadharma, and to reach our full potential. And also, I was also uh, curious about the, the results of the sadhana. Like, what, what, like why, why am I doing this? Like, what, what's the point of thinking about, you know, performing karmas in, in, that are listed in the Vedas? And I remembered uh, from many, like, lectures and things that I've attended that one of our goals is samadhana, single-pointed focus. Uh, and that's one of the prerequisites of being a seeker. And so applied fully, this, uh, this sadhana teaches us to have a constant cycle of introspection to find our purpose and to strive to reach our potential. And so obviously this is the second sadhana. It follows the first sadhana, which was uh, to study the Vedas, specifically to study the Mahavakyas and the Upanishads. And in studying the Upanishads and studying the Vedas, we learn a lot of things. Uh, one of them uh, is that we are not our body, that we are not our mind, we are not our intellect, that the world is mitya, the world is unreal. And when I first hear that, when I first think about that, I, I just really get like caught up in like, in that if, if, I, if that's not me, if I'm not that, if none of the world is important, if there's no happiness in the world, if all of that, then what's the point of acting? What's the point of doing anything? Uh, and it just, I get stuck in a loop. And, and then, uh, so in that, in thinking about that, reflecting on that, I remembered uh, verse uh, eight in chapter three of uh, Srimad Bhagavad Gita, uh, where Lord Krishna says, Niyatam kuru karmatvam karma jayo hya karma naha, sharira yatra pichate nat prasidye da karma naha. That action is superior to inaction. So do our, our, our niyata karma, perform our, uh, Nitya and Naimitya Karma, as, as Amir and Divya explained, uh, because action is superior to inaction. Action is, is a default state that our body has to act. We have to breathe to sustain our body. Just to live, we're constantly acting. And similarly, you know, our mind is constantly emoting. Our, emotion, our, our intellect is constantly thinking. There's just a constant state of activity. And then whenever we're awake, whenever we're just completely identified with this body, mind, and intellect. And so we always are acting. We always are uh, doing something at all times, even if it is simply breathing. And so uh, then there was a lot of context to this idea of making sure that we perform these daily uh, Vedic uh, karmas, these daily Nitya karmas and Naimitya karmas. So... Uh, the advantage of performing these is that they help us to be purposeful. The, they, uh, these actions divinize us uh, and they, they, uh, they replace bad habits. And you know, for me, the, the clearest example of this is that uh, this year, uh, uh, Shibani Ji has led us uh, in New York on a month-long uh, sadhana of doing daily Gayatri Japa. And you know, this combines, you know, two of the uh, Nitya karmas, uh, Snana and Sandhya that, you know, every day we were expected by 6.30 a.m. to be seated in front of Zoom with the camera on, so we had to actually be ready, uh, with, uh, you know, to have taken a shower and to be ready to do Gayatri Japa, uh, to have a focused mind, a calm mind. And it was really challenging for me to do this because, it's not just getting up early, which, you know, I do for work pretty much, but it was also to be ready early and to get up earlier than I really wanted to. And then also to do it every day. I'm not used to waking up on the weekends. 
And, and so the, there was a, a challenge of being up every day and being ready mentally every day. And it was a struggle. The first week I did okay. And the second week was extremely challenging. And the third week it started to get better. And by the end of the sadhana, it was, it was very easy for me to wake up on time uh, and just be mentally ready. Uh, and now that that strict month is over, I'm still doing my best to keep up with that sadhana on my own. But, you know, I was thinking about it and I realized how much my life had to change in order for me to do this very simple sadhana of just, you know, waking up and sitting in front of a computer in a sattvic way very well. That I had to wake up early, which means I had to go to sleep early because I didn't want to be falling asleep during japa. I had to eat better because I need I didn't want to feel just too like sick in the morning. I also had to eat well so I wasn't hungry in the morning and thinking about food rather than thinking about uh you know trying to focus on the mantra and focus on the japa. And so much of my life has to change just to do these karmas well. And in that I see how much div like by performing these div divinizing actions my entire lifestyle gets divinized. I'm replacing bad actions. I'm not sleeping in. I'm not, uh, you know, waking up and like logging into social media first thing. I'm not, um, you know, staying up late, uh, you know, wasting time doing other things. You know, I, I, I have to eat in a, in a healthier way just to function. And there, like all of that is just from this simple karma that, you know, I had the accountability to follow through on. So, uh, so for me, like this, um, the sadhana of uh, this very simple sadhana was just so powerful in changing my life. And the, the, these Vedic actions are, you know, also prescribed you know, by ashrama, as we, as we learned earlier. And you know, ashramas, as Shibadiji mentioned in her lecture, are, you know, a rough 25, you know, year periods of our lives. And and so we want to be performing these actions, you know, 365 days a year 25, for 25 years. And you know, obviously these actions might change over time, but we're performing them a lot. And what that gives us the op opportunity to do is to get more diligent in them. And, you know, that's the other part of the, of the sadhana. It's not just perform the actions in the Vedas, it's to perform them diligently. It's, uh, and to me, I understand diligence as the alignment of thought, word, and action that if I want to do japa, it's to focus on uh, uh, on actually being mentally fully present in japa. And we learn so much about, you know, focusing, you know, uh, just on the, maybe if we're doing a japa of uh, Ishadeva, to focus on the, the, the form of the, of the, of the Ishtadevata, then, you know, only part of the form, maybe like the face and then just the eye. And then just slowly narrowing our focus until we get to that single pointed focus. And, you know, if we, and I think that this diligence uh, doesn't come linearly and it doesn't come quickly. Uh, like it, it's, it's something that, you know, because every day, you know, we might be going through something new, something different, and some days are going to be good. Some days are going to be bad. But, and so we have like, uh, these the sadhanas help, do, this daily sadhana helps to, uh, to, to ground us and so with that on the, to, to make sure that we don't go too far on low days and then to elevate us when we are more mentally present. So uh, this, this diligence, it might not like, you know, for me, I mean, I definitely felt that like the, the second week and the third week, I didn't do as well as the first week because I could definitely see it's not linear progress. But by the fourth week, I was doing so well because I, I you know, I was able to build the habit and I could start start to feel the effect of doing this daily sadhana, and you know if we if I stretch that out, you know, uh, just if I start to power up slightly every day, you know, power up my diligence just a little bit, twenty five years and three hundred sixty five days a year, you do a little bit quick math, at the end of that ashrama, your power level will be over nine thousand. I, I I hate myself for that joke too, uh, but. The, but seriously, the point is that we get we have the opportunity to do these things every day and to develop more and more diligence and more and more uh, the, of that samadhana, that single pointed focus, which is just a prerequisite for our spiritual study. 
Now, the other part of this uh, sadhana that I was really intrigued by was, you know, we had spent so much time in our discussion last week and what Shabani had spent so much time in her discourse talking about, which is this concept of sadharma. And so I also uh, uh, was reflecting on the verse in the Bhagavad Gita, uh, verse chapter 335, about following our sadharma uh, and not, you know, doing our sadharma, not doing our paradharma, not doing someone else's dharma. And you know, I, I was really intrigued by that because, you know, we hear so much about what we're supposed to do, you know, from well-wishers, but from other people all around us, from our parents, from our friends, from our communities, that, you know, from the biggest decisions like our career, from the, to the smallest decisions like how we should, you know, cut our hair. There's just so much influence from everyone. And we, we have, in, in all of that, develop our own sense of self, sense of identity. And it's easy to, you know, pick other people and say, oh, I'm going to do what they do. They seem like they're doing a good job. They, and I'm just going to blindly follow them and try to figure it out. And there's a danger in that because we don't know what they're thinking. We don't know what their lives are. And we don't know that what they're doing uh, is going to be beneficial to us. Uh, because our sadharma is our own inner, inner expression. And, you know, uh, in, the, in Tattva Buddha, we learn that our body, our mind, and our intellect come from our karmas, that they're born from a satkarma janya, that they, they come from the karmas that we do, and they result in uh, our body, uh, in our mind, in our intellect, in our circumstances. And also, they result in our current vasanas and our desires and our gunas and our state of mind. And so all of this is just so individual that it's really dangerous to try to take too much from other people and apply it to ourselves without, without doing any kind of an introspection. It's, it's really important uh, because our current state, our current drives, and therefore our current dharmas are extremely personal to us. And so, you know, we have, there may be some like very strictly prescribed Nitya karmas that are really meant for everyone, but also the Vedas talk about this Svadharma that is going to help us develop ourselves. Because in the end, if we try to do other people's dharmas, then we're not going to be able to have that single pointed focus, which is the goal of the sadhana, because we're going to have like our inner drives and then there's going to be other influences that will just be stretched in too many directions rather than converging on a point. And the other, other interesting thing in this verse, um, uh, is, you know, it was also discussed in the, one of the previous talks, is that the idea of, that it's okay to do this, uh, to do your sadharma poorly. And to me, uh, the, uh, the obvious example is of, of a baby. Human nature is, you know, if you're able to, is to walk. It's, you know, it's really what separates us from monkeys is our ability to walk rather than swing on trees. Uh, it's, so that's, but babies are terrible at it. They're just, just awful at it. They'll, they'll fall they'll cry, they'll, they'll get up, they'll try to walk again, they'll fall, they'll cry, they'll get up, and eventually they figure it out. And, you know, today, I think we just refer to it as imposter syndrome, but it's the same thing. We have no idea what we're trying to do, except we're just trying to do it. And it's really comforting to know that it's okay to be bad at our sadharma, because it's our inner expression, and we'll do it, and we'll do it poorly, and we'll do it poorly, and eventually we'll do it right but because it's our inner expression. So, uh, it, it, but that doesn't really necessarily tell us what our sadharma is. It just says that we should do our sadharma, make sure that it's a reflection of what we wanna do. And in, in our discussion group last week, one of the thoughts that we had was that the sadharma is our way that we can uplift ourselves to our full potential and uplift our community as well. And we can find it through introspection, but it's, it's definitely not a talent. It's not a career. It's not a hobby. Uh, I, was, I was trying to uh, search for an example of this. And what came to mind was the movie Soul. Uh, and so I hope that it, I'm not going to spoil anything for if you haven't had a chance to see it yet. But in the movie Soul, it, it's really all about trying to find that passion in life. Um, and the main character... Uh, he 
is a musician. He wants to be a musician, but he's working as a music teacher. So he's working in his field of that he wants to work in, but he still doesn't have that that true, you know, the whole movie is about him trying to find that the, the right attitude with which he can live his life. And so I think that that example to me shows that the Sadharma is not uh, the, your career. I mean, it's not your talent because he had his talent. He had his career. He was, you know, getting promoted as a teacher, but he still wasn't uh, happy in that because it just, it wasn't, it wasn't enough for him, but it was only when he was able to use, you know, to be able to help uh, 22, to help the, um, the people around him, then was he able to really um, find that happiness, find that right attitude to life. So in, in, the, in the same way, you know, we, we need to find our, our sadharmas uh, that it'll rely perhaps on our talent. It, it will rely on our talent because if we're trying to help people, we can only do it our way. If we're trying to live to our own potential, it'll only be our way. It'll rely on our talents. It'll rely on growing our talents, developing new talents. But our sadharma is still independent of that because it's about how we use what we have, our talent, our circumstances, our hobbies, our professions, everything to serve uh, others, to live up to our full potential. And, and by having that goal of service, by having that external goal, of, or maybe not external, but uh, outside of our, ourselves, um, then it'll minimize the amount our ego grows even as our talents grow. And so that, that's the added advantage. So uh, just to, to tie everything all together, uh, the goal of this Svadharma is to find our inner expression uh, in a way that helps people, in a way that serves others, uh, but still channels our own, uh, our own uh, talents, our own vasanas, our own desires in a way so that we can develop the, the right mental attitude to life and the right uh, uh, mental focus and clarity that we need in order to be seekers. Uh, so by doing our, our dharmas, by, by following our sadharma, by doing our nitya naimitika karmas, we will develop the samadhana we need to be effective seekers. Ariyam. Ariyam Shikan, thank you for sharing. Um, you're also the first person I've ever seen make a Dragon Ball Z reference during the middle of a Chimai Mission presentation. So thank you also for that. <laughs> Everyone in the Zoom room, we all, <laughs> we all saw what happened. Anyway, um, now we have a little bit of time for a Q&A. Um, if you have any questions for any of the speakers, uh, please share them in the chat or message me privately and we'll make sure that we get those questions asked. We have a little bit of time, so please feel free to ask. Shubhanji? <laughs> yes, I will ask. Um, how, I, I want to, to know maybe from the three of you. So I know, uh, you know, I think Mira, you spoke about introspection on finding your swadharma. Can you elaborate a little bit? Because I think many people want to find their swadharma and want to know how to find it. So can you elaborate a little bit more on like the process or the procedure that you follow? Thank you, Shibani Ji, for your question. So in terms of finding your Swadharma, I think that's something that I myself am also trying to figure out still. And so I think for me and for most of us, it's like finding what our Swadharma is, but also um, kind of like reflecting on our day-to-day -day actions. And that's kind of how I've been sort of following the process. So what I do in my reflection activity is like every day, I at least try and sit down and think of some of the things that I've done through the day that might have a broader meaning or has brought some kind of value to somebody else's life or my own life. And I kind of start thinking about those things. And at the end of the week, I've been really sort of honing on on what are those activities? What are the passions behind those activities? Like, why am I doing those actions. And I think in doing so, that really allows me to reflect on like, okay, why am I doing these things? Is it because I really enjoy them or because I feel like 
I'm adding value to someone else's life. And I think in finding deeper meaning, like that sort of brings me closer to figuring out what exactly is my Swadharma um, and kind of why I'm on this earth to do a certain thing, essentially. Hmm. No questions. <laughs> Amarji, there's a question here. Hmm. Um, is there an overlap between the ashramas? Is there an overlap between the ashramas? Um, Divya, I think I'll point that one to you. Um, so I briefly talked about this in my talk, but um, basically there's kind of one ashrama that you are predominantly going to be in, but you could have varying levels of all uh, little aspects of different karmas from the other ashramas as well. So, um, so I take myself as an example. I'm kind of at the very end of the brahmacharya stage and I'm getting ready for the grihastha phase of my life. And Right now I'm engaging in sadhana and looking for ways to do seva. And that would be considered something that's in the vanaprastha stage. So I think that you can always have components of the others, but your main kind of, the majority of your activities that are going on in your day-to-day -day life would be in one ashrama mainly. Very nice point. Uh, one other point to also add on is that while we have this nice progression, um, we can also jump from the first stage to the fourth stage. Not everyone has to go through these four stages. If one has cultivated enough viveka and vairagya through thinking and detachment, they can jump to the sannyas stage during their studentship. Meaning, I have no desire for, you know, partnership or for uh, for children, etc. I'm simply ready to move on. You know, I'm simply ready to make moksha my one true only purpose. Um, and also within that, uh, moksha is the goal for all of us. Moksha is the goal for all of us. So while we also see sadhana and moksha at the very end, that doesn't mean that we can't do sadhana, we can't do seva, as Divya was so aptly mentioning. Any other questions? I think we're good. So now we'll have concluding prayer. Om Purnamada Purnamidam Purnat Purnamudachyate Purnasya Purnamadaya Purnameva Vashishyate Om Shanti 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 Harihi Om Shri Gurbhyo Namaha Harihi Om